Well, with that sobering analysis, um, what should one do, which Sam has already asked, or as a philosopher might put it, one ought one, what ought one to do? Um, and unfortunately, uh, I, I'm not about to present a panacea by any means, um, but I am going to give you perhaps the, the practical presentation of the day, which is the, the least intellectual of anything you'll see uh, here today. Um, but I'm going to cover very quickly in, in 10 or 15 minutes um, a few topics largely relating to the Royal Australian Navy's engagement program in our region. Uh, let me start by looking at what exactly is naval diplomacy. Um, it, it's difficult to define, I suspect. Uh, naval officers know it when they see it uh, and for a long time have had some trouble articulating what it is. Uh, the classical maritime strategists didn't write a great deal about navies in peacetime. Uh, so it was left for some of our more contemporary commentators to pick up the pieces, uh, perhaps starting with uh, Admiral Turner in the 70s uh, with his notion of uh, the presence mission. Uh, and in the same decade, uh, people picked up on this topic, uh, such as James Cable's seminal work, Gunboat Diplomacy, uh, and Ken Booth with Navies and Foreign Policy. Um, I could also quote uh, a former uh, Deputy Chief of uh, the Indian Navy uh, who remarked a few years ago, uh, presence, flag waving, call it what you will, seeing is believing. Uh, and there's a good point to that, I guess. Um, essentially, it's the notion of preventive deployments uh, whereby the appearance of a naval force uh, before uh, uh, prevents problems becoming conflict. Uh, now, this all might be framed through the lens of soft power, uh, and that's a fair comment, uh, but I guess one of the characteristics of uh, maritime forces, or naval forces in particular, is their flexibility. Uh, and soft power can very quickly be re-rolled re into um, hard power. Uh, now, in talking about naval diplomacy, I could be accused of being a little parochial here. Uh, today, but I'll make two observations. Uh, in recent speeches, the Minister for Defence here in Australia has uh, been tending towards uh, alluding to uh, the perhaps uh, uh, more responsible role for, uh, for defence diplomacy in the future uh, with the impending white paper. Now, I suspect that's largely uh, fiscally driven. Uh, moreover, um, the notion of a ship of war sitting alongside in a foreign port, um, festooned with lighting and hosting a reception on board for foreign dignitaries of that country, supported by an ambassador standing on the flight deck, uh, is something that we can probably imagine. Uh, and it's a little bit harder to put that picture around a battalion of troops or a squadron of tanks or a, a fighter jet. Um, so navies have been doing this uh, for some time. Uh, and take it as inherent in, in what we do in some respects. Uh, on to uh, your Navy's engagement in, in this region. Uh, predictably, it operates at a number of levels, um, strategic, operational, tactical. At the strategic level, we have Navy-to-Navy uh, -Navy talks with a number of nations, uh, Chief of Navy counterpart visits. Um, these talks are conducted uh, not only with the US, but uh, New Zealand, Japan, Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia, Korea, Thailand, uh, India, uh, amongst, uh, amongst others, at various levels. Um, I would like to focus in on perhaps uh, an operational level uh, engagement forum uh, that has really come to the fore this year, uh, and that is, uh, given that we've been talking a bit about ASEAN uh, and uh, ADMM, uh, it's the ADMM plus eight uh, Maritime Security Experts Working Group. I mention this largely because I happen to be part of the Australian delegation to that working group uh, and my immediate boss is the co-chair. Uh, that's a forum co-chaired by Malaysia and Australia. Uh, and um, I think it's fair and reasonable to say that that uh, forum has been kicking some goals this year. Uh, it hasn't been in existence for uh, uh, extensive amount of time, uh, but by the end of next year it will be three years and it's highly likely, I think, uh, that we will be conducting an at-sea 
uh, activity and exercise amongst the uh, ADMM plus nations uh, of Sydney uh, around about this time next year, in fact. Uh, now, for anyone who's been around ASEAN uh, and tack another eight countries onto that, um, that that's a pretty remarkable uh, achievement, I think. Uh, so that's a, a positive. Uh, what are the outcomes we seek from, uh, from our engagement uh, and, and diplomacy? Uh, well, they're listed up there. Uh, and we might um, refer to these as uh, confidence building measures. Uh, and Sam has highlighted the challenge of confidence building. Uh, and we deal with this on a day-to-day -day basis when we're doing it. Um, do we have to build trust before we then move into confidence building measures or do we conduct confidence building measures to build trust? Uh, now that varies from country to country um, uh, and, uh, and, and can be quite a challenge. Um, I would highlight also that those outcomes, um, they vary from state to state and from Navy to Navy um, and obviously interoperability and integration in particular uh, technology is always going to be stronger with the Western, the Western allies. Uh, you, might also, you might also see those as, uh, as KPIs, um, the goal being global good order at sea, uh, because I think that is what we're actually striving for. Uh, and uh, I, I might even add another one in there, which is understanding, understanding the region, understanding its uh, militaries and, and, and navies. And, uh, and I also wouldn't gloss over uh, the notion of goodwill, uh, which is extremely important. Uh, and up until only about two, three years ago, uh, Australia's primary um, at-sea activity between the navies of Japan and Australia was, was called goodwill X, for obvious reasons. Um, Right, a couple of quick case studies um, and, and pretty diverse ones at that. The first, the Pacific Patrol Boat Program. Uh, this originated largely in the Law of the Sea Convention from 1982. So by the mid-80s, uh, Australia was looking at a means to, uh, um, to engage in the region and it was clear that uh, countries were now going to be responsible uh, for uh, patrolling uh, the areas of which they had sovereignty over or, uh, or sovereign rights. Uh, Pacific Island nations uh, was clearly a focus to, uh, uh, to, to invest some, uh, some in, uh, in some engagement. And this took the form of, uh, of building patrol boats for the Pacific Island nations. Um, and it was a quite extensive program. It wasn't just the hardware. Uh, what we did was insert maritime surveillance advisors into those countries as well technical advisors. That is a program uh, that is ongoing today, uh, still exists. It's uh, widely, widely perceived as a, a very um, successful program. Uh, and, uh, and now attention is turning to uh, the replacement for those, if you like, in the future Pacific Patrol Boat program. Um, case study two, uh, and, and I haven't chosen China actually for any other reason than the fact that uh, Ballarat was there uh, some, months, uh, some months ago this year um, and, uh, and that was uh, centred around the, the 40th anniversary of diplomatic relations between the two countries. Whoops, sorry, we'll go back. Um, so five day ship visit uh, and some uh, activities, usually with China it's constrained to uh, search and rescue communications uh, and some joint manoeuvres. Uh, at sea. Um, I would highlight that uh, a few years ago Australia was the first Western Navy certainly to conduct a uh, live firing at sea with, with the Chinese. Um, no one else has done that uh, before or, or since. Um, some beautiful flowery words there by the CEO of Ballarat but um, this visit did take place on the end of a fairly fractious visit to Beijing by the Foreign Minister Bob Carr. Um, and I think uh, this was captured rather beautifully by uh, um, Stephen MacDonald there from, uh, from the ABC uh, and that was his observation uh, of the activities uh, on the wharf side or at the, at the seaside if you like. Uh, the future, uh, more of the same I suspect really. Um, not a lot has changed uh, over the years in, uh, in what, what we aspire to. Um, regional cooperation is critical. Uh, in all of this. 
uh, and I, I'm certainly party to a Lowy Institute paper that gave a pretty sobering analysis of uh, confidence building measures in, uh, in the region. Um, but I think uh, in our conclusions we, uh, we agreed that uh, they're still worth doing. Um, it, they, they underpin the indirect uh, confidence building measures uh, such as these two case studies. Um, uh, at least underpin any any chance or potential of proceeding to more direct confidence building measures or mechanisms such as Sam's mentioned, codes of conduct, incidents at sea agreements. Um, so that's a look at the future. Um, and in concluding, um, navies are pretty well placed for regional engagement. Um, we don't sail up there just to do regional engagement. Uh, we go up there to exercise, to project Australian power into the region. Uh, the naval diplomacy side, if you like, is actually a bit of a bonus. Um, we have a pretty, pretty long history at, uh, of it, uh, and it exists at uh, multiple levels. Um, and yes, our aim is to, uh, to build confidence, capacity and uh, interoperability to support global good order at sea. I'll leave it there. Thank you.